This podcast is recorded on the lands of the Wurundjeri people and the Aranda people. We pay our deepest respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. We all misbehave sometimes. Want to change the world, indulge in some bad Hello and welcome to Bad Behaviour. My name is Nicola. And I'm Rosalind. And we're so excited that you've decided to join us for another episode. Congratulations <laughs> you for being here. <laughs> you did it. You made a really good decision today. One of many, I'm sure. Today's going to be a good day for you. Shout out to everyone who made their beds today. I recently started making my bed, so... <laughs> Just humble brag. I feel like I've gained a new perspective and I've joined a community of people who start the day strong and that's a new thing and just welcome everyone who does that. Okay well shout out to people who didn't make their beds today because they accidentally did not get up when their alarm went off and they had very limited time to go to work and they had to choose between showering and being hygienic or you know taking care of their space and so they chose to shower Shout out to people who made their beds, but were also a little late to work. (laughs) No, I'm saying my shout out is to people who've showered. Shout out to you if you washed your face today. Shout out to everyone who's following hygiene practices in a time of a pandemic. Shout out. Don't mention the pandemic, man. Downer. (laughs) Wait a minute. It's not like they don't know about it. I hope. How did you find this podcast if you don't know about the pandemic? To those few who (laughs) may be here. That's... (laughs) Who do you think our audience is? No, that's why I'm saying. If they don't know about it, how did they find themselves here? I don't know. (laughs) Imagine that shout out was the first time you've heard of COVID. (laughs) That's... You should be so lucky that someone that you broke the news (laughs) about the last year of hell to someone. Like, actually, you would thrive off that. Honestly, you'd sit them down, you'd get them a cup of tea and you'd be like, look, honey, life has changed around us as we know it, but Rosalind is here for you (laughs) and you'd speak in third person. Honestly, I think I think I would bring bad news really well. I think I could do that really well. Like if anyone was to be discovered who just sort of clocked out for the year, I could, I would make them feel really cozy and wonderful and then I'd have to let them know, but I could do it. Here is where I interject to tell everyone about the one time where I told Rosalind that my cat had died and she literally pissed herself laughing. (laughs) So. (laughs) Okay, to be fair, can we put a little context on that? (laughs) That was very wrong of me, but I also was dealing with a lot of mental health issues, including like disassociation, which means that my reaction to a lot of things was laughter when I didn't know what to feel. All of this is to say, welcome. We've got a really great episode for you today. It's a pretty intense one, I will say. We are chatting to um, incredible, incredible investigative journalist, Jess Hill, who wrote such a cool book, See What You Made Me Do, but I'll let future voiceover Nicola give you her full bio. I love voiceover Nicola. She's very official. Her voice lowers a couple of octaves. Let's cut straight to her now. Okay. Enjoy the episode. (laughs) Today we will be speaking with Jess Hill. Jess is an investigative journalist who has been writing and researching about domestic abuse since 2014. In 2020, she won the stellar prize for her non-fiction work, See What You Made Me Do, Power, Control and Domestic Abuse. This episode contains references to domestic abuse. Please take care of yourself when listening. We have included resources to seek help in our show notes. See What You Made Me Do is basically 
a book that is attempting to show the entire phenomenon of domestic abuse. So from inside the mind to inside the home to outside and how it works across the system. And essentially doing it from all angles. So doing it from the angle and perspective of the victim, doing it from the perspective of the perpetrator, from the perspective of the children. And even in the chapters that deal with the justice system, trying to include as much as possible the perspective of police, for example, you know, really trying to get to the heart of why people make the choices they make in terms of everyone who is involved with responding to domestic abuse or who's being subjected to it. It really reflects I think what survivors go through where they know something but they might not have the language for it and I had known all the way through writing the book that I needed to find a way to really foreground the type of abuse that goes unseen which is you know essentially non-physical abuse and the system of coercive control And it wasn't until like literally a fortnight before we went to print that I read this article by Yasmin Khan, who heads up Eidfest Community Services in Brisbane, works a lot with women from the subcontinent. And she had written that basically all these women were coming to her service and saying, it's not domestic violence because he's never hit me. But then they were describing these relationships that were so oppressive. And the worst that might have happened would be like a cup of tea in the face. But what was happening to them was their liberty was being entirely overridden. Their human rights were basically being totally removed by their partners and yet they didn't think they were victims of abuse. And so Yasmin was like, it's my mission now to change the term to domestic abuse because when we say domestic violence, we're still basically talking about Or it sounds like we're still talking about that incident-based idea of violence, which is there's been an assault, there's been a rape, you know, although we don't talk much about that when it's, you know, in a marriage. But, you know, the idea that domestic violence is a collection of incidents rather than a system that perpetuates over time. And when I was reading it, I was actually like walking down the street, pushing my baby that I had had in the middle of writing it. And I just felt like oh, I have to change everything. And I felt very nervous about that because terms are really hard won in this area. And even the term domestic violence is not adequate to describe what happens inside these relationships and outside in terms of what the system does. But And so domestic abuse felt to me like, oh, it's making it sound even more benign. But I didn't know any other way to expand the conversation instantly to include non-physical forms of violence. It occurred to me that, you know, We don't call it child violence because we talk about molestation and neglect and actually the absence of contact, you know, and that's why child abuse is the term we use. And I thought, well, I, I'm, I'm not sort of putting pressure on the sector to change their language, but in terms of this book, when I want, I want people to frame right from the outset that we are talking about a broad spectrum of behaviors of which physical and sexual violence is just a part. Coercive control is a term that's been around since the 70s and certainly coercion as a form of torture we've known about since about the 1950s. But I guess coercive control has really only been understood over the last 15 years, you know, in terms of how it applies in domestic violence. And what it is, is it's a system of abuse that is bent towards control and domination. It includes all the common behaviours or tactics. I use behaviours and tactics because sometimes the perpetrator has very clear intent. Other times this happens spontaneously and unconsciously. And essentially they are that the perpetrator will isolate their partner. They will monopolise their perception. So either get them entirely focused on what their faults are and how that is creating the so-called conflict or arguments in the relationship, or they'll get them entirely focused on how they can fix this wounded person who's abusing them, but essentially focused away from what the abuse that is happening to them and all the way internal, you know, to what they can do to change. And then they do a number of things. They will demonstrate their omnipotence through either surveillance or just basically could be even just texting multiple times a day and demanding to know where a person is, but basically creating a a sense in which the gaze is always present, a feeling like you can never have any private space. 
they degrade their partners, they threaten their partners and their children and anything they hold dear, or they may threaten to self-harm, which is, again, a very hard thing for victims to realise as a form of abuse, is their partners threatening to harm themselves if they leave. They alternate punishments with rewards. So unless you're in some of the more really oppressive relationships where there is no kind of light and shade, most relationships the feeling of love and connectedness will be restored, even if it's just for a few hours every few weeks. But it's enough just to keep you sort of hanging in there and believing that it's worth just trying that extra bit more. The setting um, arbitrary rules, so basically establishing the idea that you've got to be aware that something that you're doing may be breaking a rule that you're not even aware has been set and that there will then be consequences for that. Like in the story of Carl and Sarah, Carl, who had been a gorgeous guy, totally supportive of her career as a doctor, all for gender equality, et cetera, turned on a dime in the space of a day when she announced she was pregnant and became an intensely dominating coercive controller And what he would do that really stood out to me, especially in those early days, is he'd set these arbitrary rules, which were degrading in their own right, because here he is, he's with a um, very successful female doctor, and he's telling her by what time the curtains should be drawn, um, or, you know, exactly what should go into dinner, or, you know, that all of these very, very particular rules about what she needs to do, which is very much around being a housewife and being having her focus entirely on serving him. So there's some of the things that that happen within coercive control. The thing about coercive control is that second behaviour that I mentioned, that monopolising the victim's perception, that's what makes the system invisible. By doing that, when you stop sort of being aware of what's happening to you because you're so focused inward on what you need to change. When you're isolated from supportive connections um, so that other people maybe can't make you aware of the fact that you seem to have changed or, you know, you seem more depressed or you don't seem yourself, you know, when you're basically sort of like captured in the world of your partner slash perpetrator, they start to define your reality. You know, another really key part of coercive control is to induce stability and exhaustion. And part of that can be through gaslighting. So constantly having to second guess your reality. Um, And gaslighting can be as extreme as, you know, moving your money or your keys so that you seem to remember where you've put them. They're not there. Then you think you must be going crazy because every time you put something down, it moves or you misremember it. But it can also be much more subtle, like, you know, your partner saying, perhaps early in the relationship, I love Thai food. Thai food is my favorite food. And then maybe a couple of dates later, you say, um, hey, let's go out for Thai. And they go, oh, I don't really like Thai. And you're like, but hang on, didn't you say it was your favorite food? And they said, no, I never said that. Mexican is my favorite food. It can be just very subtle undermining of your understanding of what's gone on between the two of you. And of course, that then can extend to what just happened, an assault or a degrading comment um, or an experience that happened between the two of you didn't happen. So all of those things combine into a system which is essentially unrelenting, even in the good times. Too often you just hear women saying, I wish he would hit me, so at least I just know what's going on and I'd be able to just like put my finger on what is wrong. So Jess has spoken to us about what coercive control is and how to identify it in relationships, but what about the legal side of it? Currently, in Australia, there's no consensus on how coercive control should be addressed in the law. There's also no single definition of family and domestic violence. In Victoria, coercive control is recognised in the Family Violence Protection Act of 2008. And in September 2020, A coercive control bill was put forward in New South Wales Parliament and a joint select committee on coercive control was formed. Worldwide, coercive control has been criminalised in Scotland, England, Wales and Ireland. 
More than 400 cases were recorded by the Scottish police in the first three months after the new law was introduced. By 2019, 190 cases were reported to the Crown Office, resulting in 13 convictions. However, despite these statistics, Dr Marsha Scott, a key figure in the criminalisation of coercive control in Scotland, has stated, One of the biggest concerns is that there's lots of evidence over decades that when you implement new laws that change arrest policies, you get a spike in the arrests of women who are actually victims. So with this in mind, the question still remains. In a society with systems and institutions that continually silence victims and are not trauma-informed, how can we assure that victims won't be further harmed if coercive control is criminalised? How can we assure that women won't bear the burden of this change? The conversation is emerging in Australia and also worldwide and I encourage you to be a part of it. Let's go back to Jess to talk about how harmful stereotypes can impact a victim's experience of domestic abuse. You speak about debunking this myth of that a lot of people rely on of why doesn't she leave or why does she keep going back? And I found that really useful in my reading of it because I think you give like tangible evidence as to why that kind of is not a valid response and something that is in the centre of a lot of our reactions, whether we know it or not. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how, why it's not helpful to ask those questions when it comes to domestic abuse. You know, it's fully understandable that people wonder why someone stays because, I mean, it's in some in some regards and not in every relationship, but, but in especially when there's pretty strong coercive control work, it can have a bit of the same effect as being in a cult. You know, and so when friends are part of a cult or something and you see that they're being isolated, they're not themselves anymore and maybe there's a a sense that they're in danger, you know, you can try to tell that friend all you like that you think that they need to get out or try to persuade them to look at what's happening to them and they will be very resistant to it because the, the whole system of coercive control is basically dissuading them from taking that advice. It's creating a sense of absolute loyalty with the perpetrator. So I think that it's really natural to feel confused and just, uh, I guess, befuddled as to why they can't see what you can see if you are actually seeing what's going on in their relationship, especially if children are involved and especially if children are being harmed. But that's the thing about coercive control is that often especially the degrading part of it, you know, often the person is feels so degraded, got so little self-esteem that they feel like they don't have a lot of options. Either they won't find anyone else who will be with them or they're so worried about what will happen to their partner if they leave that they might kill themselves or what will come of them that they feel like they need to stay with them until they help them get through this difficult patch, you know, as a lot of survivors will talk about. So there's just numerous rationalizations for why women will stay. Some of them hide the abuse, like having the abuse hidden from themselves. And that can be the rationalization that like marriage is for life and I signed up for this and I'm not just letting it go without really fighting for it. It can be that they end up almost gaslighting themselves and possibly their children because they it's so hard for them to keep these two versions of their partner in their head. One that is really loving and possibly quite respectful, maybe loved by other people, very popular, you know, all sorts of men who are very popular and charming are incredibly abusive in the home. They can't understand how that person is also the abusive person. So they'll just see the abuse as an aberration and see the good person as the person they keep trying to get back to. Um, But then there are really just practical reasons why women stay in these relationships. And that can be um, number one reason women don't leave is because they are fearful of being destitute and impoverished. They may be fearful of what will happen to the children through a family court process. In a lot of these relationships, for a long time, there's there can be a lot of love and the woman can be really devoted to trying to help this person. And especially if it feels like 
they are really miss or she feels like they are misunderstood by everybody you know or they've got a mental health issue or they've got a substance abuse issue or something they can see that were that to be fixed the abuse might stop when i started looking at why do women stay in these relationships it was to me just really obvious that there's like a million reasons why women stay sometimes there is something that wakes a woman up and it is just like this rationalization that's been going on in her head and it's been going for too long so i hear of women say it was my gp who finally said if you don't leave you're as bad as he is clumsy way to say it but it got her to just like admit to the fact that actually this man is a danger to my children and she left but you know consequently that woman also did spend the next like few years in family court and her son is currently in sole custody of that man and she has no contact with him so like there are serious consequences um, for a lot of people who leave these relationships some will end up in a destitute situation which it takes years to come out of if they do it all um, some end up in court cases protracted for years and years others will get out and be absolutely the best version of themselves you know like they'll get post traumatic growth you know they'll just explode into this new sense of freedom and they are the best and most amazing stories but you know there's a reason why there's a lot of survivors who say I don't feel comfortable talking calling myself a survivor I still call myself a victim because they feel like the victimization does not stop when the relationship does and it's just a roll of the dice as to whether when that relationship ends you will end up being free and it's absolutely not the role of the woman or the victim to decide whether that happens they just do their best you know it's the perpetrator who's going to decide and unfortunately given the system does so little to intervene the perpetrator has a lot more sort of autonomy over whether that abuse continues or not the book gives a lot of context in terms of historically how we see survivors and perpetrators and kind of reworking the stereotype. I think the example you give is like a a woman cowering in a corner and a man raising his fist to her. So it's this very typical um, whitewashed image of domestic abuse. When did your perception of survivors and perpetrators start changing? Like was it during your reporting on family violence or during the research? Yeah, I think just talking to a lot of victim survivors, you know, hearing in every story, they're kind of incredible stories of resistance and agency and hearing them talk about that and how little that was recognised and how upsetting that is for a lot of women, you know, that they became these um, sort of strategic masterminds in their relationships and yet they're portrayed as these passive whimpering women who are at the sort of whim and behest of a, of a perpetrator. Actually, a lot of the time, a lot of these women feel like, well, I must be partly at fault because I'm not that cowering woman. So they don't see themselves in the posters and in the awareness campaigns because they see themselves fighting back. Like they see themselves yelling when they've just had enough or they see themselves pushing back or you know using physical resistance in in a number of cases and so then they think that's mutualized violence you know like i gave as good as i got not realizing that like actually what's happening is they are defending themselves or defending their dignity and were it not for the attacks that they continually receive and the system of course of control being used against them they wouldn't be doing that <laughs> But it's all of the narrative around victims is so much around the perfect victim is somebody who is afraid, who is essentially passive, but also does everything they can to keep their children safe, like does all of these impossible things that are like largely incompatible with one another so that the justice system will be able to see that they are deserving of a response or of protection. And the woman who does ends up, you know, abusing substances or maybe ends up with an eating disorder or who resists physically, you know, she is not in that victim category anymore. Because she's used agency, she's now sort of like almost as bad as the perpetrator. <laughs>
I wanted to learn more about the idea of women resisting and reclaiming their autonomy in these abusive relationships. So I reached out to my colleague and friend, Rachel Neary. Rachel has worked in the domestic violence sector for over 10 years and is currently employed at the Women's Safety Services of Central Australia. So Rachel, how do we see women resisting in abusive relationships and what are some of the types of behaviours that we see? So resistance within a controlling relationship often to an outsider can look like quite strange or odd behaviours from someone experiencing control or domestic abuse or domestic violence within intimate relationships. So it could be things like hiding money under a bed. It could be things like actually verbal abuse towards the perpetrator in a, as a way of bringing on a physical assault so that the victim survivor has a sense of control over when they experience that violence or when they experience that emotional or verbal abuse. Really what it is is actually someone trying to find ways in which they can have some sense of control um, or agency over what they're experiencing. So it could be other things around their children. It could be getting children out of the house if they believe that there's going to be abusive situation about to happen or it can include things such as inviting friends over or can also very often involve consuming a lot of drugs or alcohol as a way of saying, okay, yes, you can control me, but I'm not going to be 100% compass mentis when you are controlling me. And how do we perceive these resistant behaviours? What we're seeing is a lot of occurrences of police being called to incidents and there being a misidentification of the person most in need of protection and the person committing an act of domestic family violence. And so often police can be called and what they're seeing is a victim survivor who they don't at that time know as a victim survivor being agitated, being aggressive. Maybe they're pushing the male partner. Maybe they're yelling, screaming, abusive. Maybe they're intoxicated. So it's very easy for police to assume that this person is the aggressor in this situation. But the other thing that we can see is often victim survivors acting uh, strangely, like I mentioned before. So yes, it can involve abuse of drugs or alcohol, but it can also involve protecting the, the perpetrator or the user of violence or the person who is being controlling in the relationship. And when they are protecting that person, it's about them protecting themselves. So if they're publicly defending the controlling party or they're speaking really nicely about them or various other things, it's their way of protecting themselves. So they can say to their partner later on, look, you saw what I said, you saw what I did, those kinds of things. It also involves not disclosing the violence. Um, and that's because resistance can also include having a sense of Uh, retaining a sense of dignity around their situation and for their family as well. In your time working in the sector, are there any stories of resistance that have stuck with you? Yeah, so many stories. And I think it wasn't until I've also been able to view women's experiences through this lens of resistance that I've seen those occurrences really clearly. So examples particularly around starting the verbal abuse, you know, in public situations as well uh, is often a form of resistance. What else have I seen? I think a lot of things around inviting family around is a big one, having witnesses to what's going on, feeling safe in that regard. Another big one is people becoming very transitory in their lifestyle. So it's not just about escaping a violent perpetrator. Often that is a whole family unit, including the person who's being controlling, that is moving around from place to place. And that's a big part about the victim survivor wanting a sense of control around things, but also not wanting people to find out because they feel like for them, if other people find out, they um, are more at risk of children being removed and those types of things. So actually having family units being very mobile and transitory can be a big form of resistance when a victim survivor is um, part of that um, decision-making to be on the move. 
And how do we better recognise and celebrate these acts of resistance? I think when we can look at not just what individuals do and finding ways of amplifying their voices and amplifying their stories in a way that they have, of course, control over their stories, but also looking at what whole communities do. So looking at these stories in an in-depth way, oh, and when that thing happened, who stood up for you or who came in and stopped the violence? And, you know, in so many contexts, we can look at what happens when a bystander does intervene and is there more than one person and how can we as a whole community resist that violence, particularly around the way we talk about violence? That's really important in, as a way of resisting violence, holding perpetrators to account in the language that we use, not having passive language to talk about what um, people's experience of domestic family and sexual violence is. You know, we often talk about women's lives being lost due to domestic family violence, and it's very passive language. We need to look about women being murdered by their male husbands, if that's what the statistic that we're looking at. We need to keep perpetrators in the language and in the picture and their actions held to account. We shouldn't be talking about, you know, the large amounts of women being raped. We've got to actually say raped by men. We've got to include these people within the language that we use and hold them to account. But that's the same when we're talking about collective stories of resistance. We want to hear about what communities, how communities have stood up to this, what's happened after an event in a way that men and women together have come together and said, this thing that's happened is not okay. And those stories of resistance at that collective level are really inspiring and can lead whole communities to transform. Season two of Bad Behaviour is sponsored by Muddy Buddy. Muddy Buddy is an incredible organisation that makes period underwear. Both Nicola and I have actually used Muddy Buddy underwear for a while now, and we are super excited about this collaboration. As you know, I'm super passionate about sustainability, and that's something that Muddy Buddy is passionate about too. Muddy Buddy undies are sustainable. They're made to be washed and reused. Did you know that the average person will use 11,000 menstrual disposable products in their lifetime? Yeah, that's a lot. In fact, it's estimated that over 100 billion menstrual disposables end up in landfill annually. Muddy Buddy Period Underwear is a great solution to help change that. You can check out their products at muddybuddy.com and use code BAD15 for 15% off. That's code BAD15. Muddy Buddy is the new way to period. In the book, you talk about the ad campaign that I don't know if it's still on television or not, but the one where it's a group of friends and a phone call happens to a man's partner and he's verbally abusive to her and then he, his friends call him out and how that can have more harm than good because where does the humiliation go after? So I'm wondering in those groups, if you're a man and you have a tiny group of friends that regularly use abusive language, et cetera, et cetera, how do you address it? What is an effective way to call it out without it still having that impact on the woman? Yeah. I mean, it's really difficult. My problem with that ad is really like, if you're going to call this guy out in public in front of all of his friends and just say it's not on and then the sort of the conversation's over, like full stop, it's humiliating and that's kind of satisfying when you're watching it. You're like, yeah, you know, shut up, like, and, and good, they've all called you out. But like that humiliation, as you say, where's he going to take that? He takes it home and he blames his partner for it, you know, because it's like it's your fault my friends called me out today and made me feel really uncomfortable. On that ad particularly, I wanted to see something, again, anti-patriarchal. The problem with patriarchy is that the whole system of patriarchy is that men shame each other into behaving in certain ways, either um, consciously or unconsciously. So what about having something that upends that and has a guy sort of approach that guy maybe in private and just go, hey, mate, I just heard what, you know, you were saying on the phone. That doesn't sound like you, man. Like, you know, Kate's a gorgeous person. What's going on? You know, just but talk to him, like get draw him out, approach him with dignity, like because you might not think that he deserves that. But the point is what we are all seeking is dignity. And unless we approach 
men who are like this with a certain amount of dignity and responsibility together will just enrage them. And it might feel good in the in the moment and that horrible term virtue signaling, it's sort of like we're not going to put up with this. But what are we actually trying to get? Are we trying to get results or are we trying to feel good about a, a singular moment that we have standing up to someone? So in situations where there's toxic masculinity um, that's really prevalent in a group, I think sometimes just having those like brave conversations and just asking like, hey, what's going on here? There's one guy, this story has always stuck with me. And he said, um, he's worked on a construction site. He always wears a rainbow bandana. His name's Ian Welsh. So he was going into the lift and there's always a guy who's driving the lift and the lift was packed. And the guy driving the lift sees his rainbow bandana and just goes, what the hell's going on with that? And, um, and there's this silence and says something like, you know, oh, I got it in Sydney, mate. And it feels like to all the men in the lift, there's going to be a confrontation. And then Ian, instead of like amping it up, just says, but, you know, what about this is so challenging to you? Like, why is it that you feel so challenged by it? And the guy just pauses and sort of, it's like he comes out of this like trance and says, you know what, I, I don't know, actually, I think it's just, you know, my dad used to say all this stuff about fags and I don't know, I, I, it doesn't really bother, I don't know. You know, he was just confused. Anyway, the, the moment that Ian sort of opened up there with that guy, that guy ended up coming to him and chatting with him later about it and ended up being a real confidant. And I think it was a few years later, they saw each other on a construction site again and this guy came up to Ian and said, you know, I want to thank you. I think you basically saved my marriage that day because I realized that I don't want to be my father, but that's what I was becoming. They're the sorts of things like, you know, it's really takes a lot of courage to do that in the moment. I don't always have that courage. I don't expect everyone to be like a 24 hour intervening bystander or constantly policing their friends um, because you risk losing those connections, don't you? And, you know, you might like a lot about that person except for the things that they say and you intervene and they never want to talk to you again. Like, I mean, it, there is a lot of risk in this. If you just come at them with compassion and dignity, you can achieve a lot without risking so much in the sense of like calling them out in a big group and risking that actually the rest of the group might go, oh, you know, you're too much trouble to have out and we're not going to ask you again mentioned humiliated fury a couple of times. Would you be able to give a quick definition of that? It's a term that goes back to the 1970s. This female uh, psychoanalyst, Helen Block Lewis, who was really pioneering at the time, there weren't a lot of female psychoanalysts in the 1970s. And she came up with this term to basically describe when a man feels a sense of unacknowledged toxic shame and in the moment feels that shame start to rise and in order to overpower it, becomes this like, you know, object of fury and puts that shame on the other person who's witnessing him being shamed. And so in becoming angry and, you know, a type of powerful, they're able to feel like their shame has been displaced, they're back in control and they've solved that issue of, um, of feeling shamed. But often what happens is this humiliated fury and this deep sense of unacknowledged shame that a lot of men have because they've been raised to believe that they absolutely must be invulnerable, which is absolutely impossible. So there's always unacknowledged shame in a lot of men. It's just about how they choose to deal with it. When they choose to respond to it with anger, like the schoolyard bully, that humiliated fury can be extremely dangerous because shame is a very powerful emotion. Guys particularly are raised to believe that thing of not feeling vulnerable, shame is the greatest vulnerability that we have. It makes us feel like we want the floor to open up and to swallow us whole. It doesn't make us feel like we need to improve this or we need to be a bit better at this or that. It just makes us feel like we are utterly unlovable, that we must just um, annihilate ourselves, you know, <laughs> like in its worst possible instances. A lot of us, when we feel shame, will maybe want to be alone or we might retreat to self-harm or we might go to a therapist and try to work it out with them. But unfortunately, there are, you know, a good percentage of people and particularly men who deal with shame by um, replacing it with anger. That is an incredibly dangerous disposition to have. And so often when I'm looking at domestic abuse cases, if I see that really sort of like almost just bubbling under the surface level of shame and humiliation, 
that to me feels like the most dangerous perpetrator because what are they willing to do to not feel that and to not own up to that shame and you know a number of them are willing to murder in order to expel that feeling and to feel even that momentary sense of power With the Me Too movement and with COVID as well, with home being one of the most dangerous places for a woman, it kind of feels like we're at these various turning points of how we listen to survivors and how we accept their stories and testimonies. Do you think the circumstances have changed with how we look at victims and perpetrators in the last couple of years? Oh, definitely especially in Australia, the focus is very strong. And it's, I think it's quite remarkable that it has stayed on the agenda for this long. I thought that by the time I published the book, we would have moved on, you know, people wouldn't want to talk about it anymore. There's just so much to understand and so much wrong-headed thinking to overcome that I think that's why we keep on talking about it because every time it feels like the topic's getting a bit old, something else comes up and people just are newly shocked they're like newly shocked at the way, you know, a certain member of police has handled a case or they're newly shocked at what the family court has done or, you know, newly shocked at a homicide and a level of brutality that's come after a relationship that maybe had no physical violence in it at all. I think that the confounding nature of it does keep people sort of fascinated, which then keeps them learning about it. Thank you so much to the incredible Jess Hill for taking the time to speak to us. Jess Hill has been such an incredible campaigner and advocate in the domestic abuse space and I was so grateful to be able to connect with her. And thank you for listening. I just wanted to say that I know that this subject matter is quite intense, so I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down and listen to this episode because I think it's really important that we know about these things, that we know about coercive control, that we know that there's these conversations happening and that people have a language around it to start talking about it, to start looking at their own relationships and the relationships of people around them so that they can start seeing the high risk factors and the early warning signs. I think that's so important. But I also did want to say that it can be really difficult to listen to things like this. And for Rosalind and I, this episode was difficult to make, especially right now. It's just coming up on the end of March. We've just had the March for Justice on Monday, which was an incredible march that women all across Australia gathered to fight and have their voices heard against what's happening in Australia with our government um, and how they're not listening and believing survivors. And also, yeah, it's it's been a hard couple of months, particularly, you know, in my local community where I live in Alice Springs at the beginning of this year, we lost a really incredible um, anti-violence activists in our community, the incredible Miss Rabunja. She was murdered by her partner and that was incredibly difficult. And um, this community has been in a lot of grief and felt that really deeply. So I think all of this is to say that if you're feeling really exhausted and intensely emotional and anxiety ridden and these last couple of weeks and months have been difficult for you I am right there with you I feel you it's really it has it has been difficult for me as well um, if I'm being honest and I think it's hard to not feel like this just happens on a loop you know like every couple of months we rally we organize We gather with friends to disclose stories and then the press dies down, 
the hype dies down and then a couple of months pass, another woman loses her life or another woman has her autonomy taken away and starts an intense lifelong journey to healing. So I'm just trying to say that I really am sending lots of love to people who have been feeling it deeply these last couple of weeks and particularly to all the victim survivors, whether you're at the stage of your journey where you've disclosed or you've never told anyone, you know, I think you are an incredible, incredible person and you have so much strength inside of you. Many, 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 many people will hear I'm exhausted by this cycle and go, yeah, me too. I'm exhausted by this cycle. You know, I'm exhausted by the stereotypes that I learned and have internalized and I'm still working through. So my experiences with it has made it really hard when these things come around. But at the same time, we are inheriting a fight that is many generations old and We have seen some incredible changes in our lifetime and before. We have a lot of work to go, but we are talking about it now. We have this platform, Bad Behaviour, in which to speak about these things and these conversations through hearing things like this and through talking to people like Jess Hill. We have the language to start those conversations and to frame them better and use the vocabulary that's better and more apt, (laughs) more progressive there's so much to be thankful for as well so I'm exhausted too but we have hope throughout this episode you can hear Jess that's what she always goes back to right she goes back to the resistance of women in these controlling relationships you know they're resisting in so many different ways that's something that we need to be better at acknowledging we need to be better at meeting women where they are at Um, really moving away from these toxic myths about why didn't she leave, why did she stay, and starting to look at how there can be, you know, strength in that for certain situations and how just by simply turning up to the fight, we're resisting in a way that's super powerful. And if you're listening to this, you are powerful because you got through it. (laughs) You got through it and you're learning You're taking steps, so. It's beautiful to be able to think that, you know, someone is listening to this and like, you know, maybe today no one's told you that you're powerful, but we're going to tell you that you're powerful and that you are incredible. You will get through this. You are doing your best right now. It may not feel like it. It may feel really exhausting and you may feel super pessimistic and the world may look really gray right now, but I just wanted to acknowledge that you have resisted in many ways today and I hope that you take care of yourself Roz kind of pushed me to do this and I'm going to do it because she's <laughs> she's my number one fan and my, um, you know, president of my fan club, etc., etc. <laughs> oh, I'll do an intro then because you're going to downplay it. Nicola is an incredible poet. You should follow her on Nicola underscore underscore Louise. She has some beautiful poems there. This is one of them, which is very apt when we're talking about powerful women Nicola, take it away. Her rage consumed her. From her toes to the tips of her fingers, it spilled into the world, destroying all who dared deny her bounds. She scorched the earth, and from the charred black grew a revolution. fucking love that poem thank you so much for listening to this episode of bad behavior if you'd like to contact us you can find us on instagram at bad behavior podcast or send us an email at bad behavior podcast at gmail.com thank you so much and we'll catch you on the next one the executive producer for this episode was nicola Cranage. Bad Behaviour is produced by Rosalind Enkatel, Nicola Cranage, and Namcheju Magembe. Hosted by Rosalind Enkatel and Nicola Cranage. Editing and sound design by Namcheju Magembe. Our logo was designed by Bonnie Eichelberger. <laughs>
misbehave sometimes Wanna change the world, indulge in some bad behavior 